Next talk would be a reproducible post-processing for cardiac MRI by Dr. Arlista Young from uh, King's College, London. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, there we go. Hopefully, you can you can see a. Um, try and get rid of some of these windows. Okay, is that okay? Yes. Uh, great. So my name is Alistair Young, I'm professor of biomedical engineering at King's College London. And normally I would be over here at St. Thomas's Hospital, um, however, virtually uh, working at the moment. So very pleased to be asked to talk about reproducible post-processing for cardiac MRI. And what I thought I might do is uh, talk a little bit about cardiac MRI, but mostly about um, ways in which the community is putting together processes and protocols for facilitating reproducible research in this field. So uh, I don't have anything to disclose. So cardiac MRI can provide a wealth of information on heart disease. Uh, and I won't have time to talk about all the um, contrast mechanisms and um, protocols that you can run. I'm going to focus on shape and motion uh, mostly. And so MRI is a, a very sensitive technique uh, for getting images inside the heart at any angle. So what we see here is what's known as a short axis view, uh, which is cutting through the left and the right ventricles. So the left ventricle looks kind of circular and the right ventricle is kind of crescent shaped. But if we were to make another slice kind of at this orientation here through the left ventricle, we would see that the mitral valve here and the apex of the left ventricle here, and the right ventricle is not seen because it's kind of behind. But we can composite these images in 3D. So they're often taken with two dimensional slices with separate breath holes. But if you take enough of them, you can build up a lot of slices with different orientations. And then you can build up a, a three dimensional moving shape model, which we use for characterizing disease. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can pull out from the segmentation of the images, but also the tracking of the wall motion. So if you were a clinician, you would be immediately able to see that there is an infarct in this region on the um, anterior surface of the left ventricle here. Uh, a heart attack has led to muscle dying so that the wall thickness is um, it's, it's a thin myocardium here, and the um, thickening is reduced. Um, and from the three-dimensional shape models, uh, this one doesn't seem to be beating, but it's a sort of a normal looking heart, but we can also have global disease, which causes the muscle wall to thicken and the cavity wall to get quite small. So that's known as concentric hypertrophy or other disease mechanisms in which the myocardium becomes quite thin and the cavity becomes quite large, and that's called eccentric hypertrophy. So from these differences in shape, you can get a lot of information about prognosis and development of disease and also effective treatments. So there's a large number of um, MRI studies on clinicaltrials.gov, you can see that there's, there's a, a lot of them going on. And over the years, they've become larger and larger. Uh, one of the first studies, epidemiological studies to use cardiac MRI was the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, which started kind of 2002. And they've been following patients for about 20 years now. Um, more recently, the UK Biobank has imaged or plans to image about 100,000 uh, people just um, in the general population. And it's one of the largest 
uh, cardiac MRI studies in the world. Um, but there are others like the Society of the Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance, which is developing their own registry of clinical cases. And this has now passed 100,000 cases in their registry. Um, and there are mechanisms by which you can access these data. Uh, so there's a biobank application process and an, an SCMR registration um, process that you can see on the SCMR website as well. So they're becoming uh, more widely available. Uh, for instance, in the, in the UK biobank, um, it's really set up for reproducible research because if you if you do an application, you are required to upload your results back into the biobank database. And uh, then you can uh, actually uh, download that data set uh, for your own research. So from someone else's results, you can download and carry on. And we ran the study uh, in collaboration with Wen Bai at the um, Imperial College London, in which we were testing the reproducibility of a shape atlas in describing relationships between cardiac shape and cardiovascular risk factors like diabetes and smoking and high, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And uh, what we were able to show in that study in about 5,000 UK biobank cases was that um, the associations between um, ventricular shape and risk factors were higher. So we had higher AUC um, area under the ROC curve with uh, these atlases than we were able to get just from standard measures of mass and volume. And these metrics didn't change much depending on which atlas we used. So the surface atlas was from um, our group which was fitting shape models to contours, and the volume atlas was from the imperial group, which was more an image registration type approach. Uh, but similar results were, were found in all cases, and they were all better than the standard methods. So that's one way of facilitating reproducible research, but another way is to use uh, what are known as challenges. So a challenge is an open competition or a benchmark exercise in which um, we make data available to a large number of groups uh, and establish a, um, a benchmark for this, um, for this particular data set. So I'm just gonna try and stop it from automatically advancing here. Um, the aim is to highlight current gaps and next steps in the field and advance the field. And in certain communities like the Mikai community, there's been a lot of work done recently on developing um, high quality challenges. And these are often run in a workshop, for instance, uh, BRATS or the one that I'm involved with is called Stackon. And it's run in association with Mikai in this case, but there are other conferences that do this like um, ISB. And recently, um, particularly with Lena Meyer-Hein and um, her colleagues, um, there's been a lot of work done on improving the quality of challenges. So the idea of a good challenge is that it should address uh, a well-defined problem relative to, to, to the community, provide um, high quality data and um, it should include issues like what types of methods are used for the sharing, who can participate, whether the participants can also process their own data and how results will be published, etc. Um, the assessment procedure is also very important as well. So it can be a bit of a meandering process to, to organize one of these challenges, um, but there's usually a, a setup or a dry run phase in which um, challenge data may be published as an initial result. And then there's a, um, 
a training phase in which the training data are made available and some annotations are made available to participants. And then there might be a, a validation phase run concurrently with that in which groups can uh, see how well their method is generalizing to hidden annotations. And after that, the individual groups might, might publish their results in their own papers. But there's always often a testing phase, which is using uh, data which has not been previously seen. And uh, this is either done either on site or, or asynchronously. And then there's a report which is collating results. Um, one thing is that with these challenges, you can often expect a lot of people registering, but relatively few people actually providing their testing data. Um, I don't think that um, that's a bad thing so much um, because it's good to get people involved in, in, the, in the study in a wide variety in the community. A lot of groups just wanting to get their hands on data <laughs> but, and don't participate in the later, later phases of the challenge. But even so, it's um, able to uh, get, get the a wider community involved. So I've been working with the um, Stackom challenge, which has been going for uh, over 10 years now. And you can find more information at stackom.cardiacatlas.org. Um, and each year we're, we're publishing a volume of proceedings. So I just wanted to just highlight a couple of um, major uh, popular challenges. Um, this one was run um, out of Creatus in, in uh, Lyon and um, it's called ACDC. And it was uh, the, one of the first challenges after the machine learning kind of revolution happened in 2016. So there were a lot, there's a lot of interest in it and it was a segmentation challenge. Um, also in that year, there was another very popular challenge, which was um, Zhihai Zhang from Fudan in China, who made available um, MRI and CT data sets unpaired for domain adaptation. So the idea is that you train your algorithm on one domain and test it on another domain. And this has been picked up and, and used in a variety of contexts uh, since then. Uh, but one issue that we found was that if you are doing ground truth from a single center, then you can be biased because each center gives different ways of um, creating their ground truth. So this was quite an um, interesting study that Arvind Swinesia Putra did. Um, a few years back, looking at the way that different core labs, and these are very highly regarded uh, core labs that do clinical trials around the world, uh, how they do their contouring. And there was a, a bit of variation, particularly near the apex and the base, where it's open to interpretation where exactly these contours go. Uh, in the mid ventricle, it's more um, uh, consistent, if you like. So we were uh, able to kind of generate a consensus for a small number of cases. And this is um, the result of what we call um, JCMR readers from seven different core labs and their biases compared with the consensus. So you can see that within each core lab, they're very consistent, but between core labs, there you can get biases which are fairly significant in some cases. Um, in, in diastolic volume, in systolic volume, that's the, the chamber size of the left ventricle and mass. And if you, one, one thing that Arvind did uh, was run a few of the early machine learning methods on this consensus data set and found that, that um, some of the methods generalized quite well and some of them didn't. One of the reasons why the early um, paper from Wenzhou Bai's group was just trained on UK Biobank and there was a comment earlier I think that that because that's a single scanner it doesn't really generalize to other scanners without the addition of some extra tricks which they've since done in their algorithm. 
And one of our um, early approaches to doing that was to generate these consensus contours from many different readers and then grading readers according to sensitivity and specificity um, in this kind of uh, histogram type type way there. And you can read about that in Arvin's paper in MedIA. Um, so a couple of other challenges that I thought I would uh, mention briefly is um, perfusion. So this is uh, a way of measuring blood flow in myocardium. It's kind of similar to what was, was mentioned just now on arterial spin labeling, but it's using a contrast agent which injects into the uh, veins and initially appears in the right ventricle and then the left ventricle and then the myocardium lights up as well. So uh, this was a challenge looking at uh, motion correction and the effects of that on the parameters which were obtained. This is another um, challenge which we ran, which is more to do with extracting biophysical parameters like myocardial stiffness from MRI um, and additional pressure recordings. The thing was odd about this was we didn't really have a, a ground truth because we didn't know what the stiffness was. So we were only able to compare results between different um, groups. And even that was an interesting exercise to do um, to show how different me methods vary. Um, in addition to these uh, conferences, the, one of the early challenges which made a big difference to the field was the Kaggle one on cardiac MRI. And although there wasn't any um, segmentations available, there was um, clinical information like volumes. And that was enough to get a lot of people interested in participating who would never have come across a cardiac MRI otherwise. So um, it was run in 2015 and, and in 2016 and, and was really instrumental in getting a lot of uh, people uh, into this space. So I just wanted to finish up with a few comments about um, re uh, reporting challenges and um, reproducibility and rigor, the three R's, if you like. So um, first thing to note is that we should always look at the, um, the use case and the application. So we should always include clinical as well as technical metrics. In, in, in cardiac MRI, this would be mass of the heart, volume at end diastole and systole ejection fraction, things like that. Uh, the design should include who was eligible for participation and who wasn't, how the data was pre-processed. In other words, did it come directly from the scanner or was there some massaging happening? Uh, to get it into a format where people could use it. Where does the data come from? Um, and where do the algorithms come from? So this is an open field that I think needs a lot of work in terms of describing algorithms and their provenance so that people can reproduce them. Um, so sometimes there's a distinct distinction between the challenge cohort, in other words, the data available in the challenge and the cohort for which the challenge is designed or the target cohort. And if there are any differences there, they, they should be um, clear and highlighted. And finally, any recommendations uh, should be included in the report to point the way for future work and highlight any deficiencies. So for reproducibility, it's good to keep an open call on these challenges so that you make a data available for continuous benchmarking into the future. And uh, it's also very good to have um, your algorithms open source so that other people can um, test them um, on, a, on a level playing field. Um, one of the things that isn't, doesn't happen very much is the test-retest reliability, which is very important. So this means that you need to get not only one scan of your participant, but two scans, um, usually within half an hour or so. And that gives you an idea of what the actual clinical variability is, which is often much higher than just the observer variability. 
Um, and the third R is, is rigor. So talk, we talked about having predefined um, endpoints and um, we, we should make sure that those don't drift during the challenge. Uh, well-defined tasks and, and metrics. Um, a, a quality um, assurance program and also one thing that happens quite a lot is that there's too much focus on a leaderboard in these challenges so often the leaderboard doesn't really have a, a clinical meaningful effect size between the first um, the person who wins the challenge say and the person who say got ranked 10th and what's more important is um, how are these methods different and, and what's their strengths and weaknesses? And there's this thing called overfitting of the crowds, which is in this interesting blog by, uh, I think called, the name is now Lauren Oakton Rayner in Australia, which uh, makes the point that um, if you have a hundred participants, the winner can actually just be a lucky set of parameters and but not really an advance in the, in the field. So in conclusion, um, for cardiac MRI, there's a lot of challenges available and I urge you to participate in them or even design your own. Um, the algorithms should be um, open source ideally and um, the report should include a description of ontologies. And the results should uh, contain provenance of um, the data as well as the algorithms, but don't pay attention too much to the leaderboard. So uh, thanks very much. And uh, it was a pleasure to participate in this. Okay, thank you for a nice talk, Dr. Young. Uh, this presentation is open to question. Uh, regarding the challenge, I have a quick question. So, uh, were there any? So, so I think for the challenges, it it's uh, very important and very difficult to set a assessment criteria. And were there any cases? So, you you said uh, always set a quantitative uh, assessment, like endpoint for each challenges. But but in is there any cases? Were there any cases that uh, the the result kind of overfits to the that quantitative assessment uh, criteria, but it's not kind of translate well translated to real clinical situations. Yeah, um, that's something that you have to uh, keep in mind and, and guard against quite a bit. So, uh, particularly if the target cohort, like um, often you want to run this on patients with particular diseases, but if your challenges run on normal volunteers, then there, there's a chance that the, the algorithms won't work or generalize well. Um, so in, indeed, I, I think that um, yeah. having patient data and being able to um, have a variety of sources, so a variety of scanners, a variety of sites is very important. Okay, thank you. May I ask, um, uh, with, with simulated data, you know the ground truth, but, but in, in several of these techniques that you mentioned, the ground truth is, of course, not known. Um, how, do you, how do you look at that in, in challenges? Yeah, and so unless you have a wide variety of readers, you, you can be biased to your, to your reader ground truth. So it actually, the simulated, um, way of doing it is probably a, a much better approach. If we can get really realistic uh, looking images, which are not so distinguishable from actual clinical images, then um, that is much more satisfying because then you don't have to go through the, the monkey brain, I guess, to, to get your ground truth. And um, that, that is advancing at leaps and bounds. So the, the um, uh, generative adversarial networks are creating quite realistic images. Uh, you can condition that on particular um, segmentations and there's a lot of work being done in that area. 
um, in which it's hard to distinguish between these these fake images and and real images now. And so I think that's that's definitely a way to go in the future. Yeah, I think these are important questions. <clears throat> we also ran into them when trying to do a QSM uh, susceptibility mapping reconstruction challenge. In the first challenge, our ground truth data quality was not very high. So the results ended up fitting to the root mean squared error um, metric that we provided. So things did kind of overfit. Results ended up being too over smooth, just so that the RMSE is small. Um, but the images were not necessarily high visual quality, if you will. And in the second challenge to kind of help address that problem, we started from a um, simulated numerical ground truth. In that case, we did have a nice, well-defined uh, baseline. But of course, it was difficult to ensure that um, methods or what we simulated is a good representation of the reality and the problem is not super easy. And we took some steps to ensure that, um, like starting from a high resolution model, subsampling this to kind of help represent the finite extent of case space we can cover, adding noise and things like that. In that case, I think the challenge, even from a numerical data, become very difficult uh, to get good quality images, just like it is for the real life data. And in QSM also, there is no true uh, ground truth. So that was one of the challenges. So we tried to find a good balance between overfitting to the um, numerical metric and not having a, a good ground truth. So I think those are great points. <clears throat>